Hello, my name is Chris Snowden. I'm the Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. The following video is one of a series of webinars conceived and hosted by the IEA to understand and debate many of the issues raised by the coronavirus pandemic. History shows that prohibitionists never allow a crisis to go to waste. So has the pandemic provided a vital cover for nanny statists to push through their agenda? Are any of the new restrictions that have been implemented justified? And are they likely to remain in place once the pandemic has passed? In this film, we hear from an esteemed panel of academic experts who will be discussing and debating such questions around the topic of prohibition and the pandemic. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Um, firstly, we have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Myron, who is Senior Lecturer in Economics at Harvard University and Director of Economic Studies at the Cato Institute. He is uh, the author of uh, various uh, articles and books, uh, one of which is called Drug War Crimes. We also have uh, Dr. Wesley Clark. He is Executive Professor of Public Health at Santa Clara University, and uh, he's also a physician. And from London, we have uh, Dr. Jamie White. Uh, he is the former research director at the IEA and the author of several books, including uh, one called Crimes Against Logic. He also wrote the forward, I should say, to um, this IEA book, which came out around about 10 years ago, Prohibitions, uh, which you can download. There might be a link coming up in the, um, in the chat. And it's not just about the prohibition of alcohol. It's also, uh, also looked at various um, products and activities that have been banned over the years, including boxing, pornography, firearms, um, gambling, and uh, human body parts. So I recommend this one to you. Um, as I say, free to download from the IEA website. Now, the subject of discussion this evening is, um, is prohibition. In January, we marked the 100th anniversary of the beginning of prohibition in America, which of course was on alcohol, lasted until 1933, and has become almost the go-to example for government overreach. Um, and here we are in May, and I ran the figures on this uh, just yesterday. I was so very shocked, really, to see that up until two weeks ago, at any time last month, one in four people around the world were living under alcohol prohibition. About one in five were living under uh, tobacco prohibition, and at least one in four living, and still are living, in fact, under prohibition of buying e-cigarette fluid. Um, so prohibition has by no means gone away. There's probably more people living under, under it um, until quite recently than ever before. A large part of that is India. We have a vast population, and India has brought in a ban on the sale of e-cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, cigarettes, and alcohol as part of its lockdown. Um, but it's not alone in that. Uh, various countries have done the same. There's prohibition ongoing in South Africa, in Panama, in Greenland, in Zimbabwe, most of Argentina, parts of Thailand, and um, a few, several other countries, including Mexico, Peru, and Malaysia, have uh, all banned brewing. That's led to a, a big shortage of beer, particularly in, in Mexico, and about 150 people have died in the last two weeks in Mexico as a result of drinking unsafe alcohol. Um, consequences like that will not be a surprise to students of history because uh, oh, the, the US uh, Nobel experiment did show many of the negative unintended consequences. However, we also want to look at uh, any positive consequences, uh, look at the rationale for these bans under lockdown um, and uh, discuss whether they are likely to remain in place in any, in any way, even if uh, watered down a little bit when the pandemic, the pandemic ends. So if I could start um, by discussing the, the US experience, um, I'll start with a very broad question, uh, quite a tricky question perhaps, but simply put, why did it happen? Why did it happen in that particular time and place? Anybody want to uh, g give a suggestion? Sure. Uh, so prohibition in the US actually had a history that goes back to the 1830s or 1840s. There were prohibitions in a number of states uh, against alcohol. Uh, they were in states that were on the East Coast and that were receiving large numbers of Irish immigrants at the time. And so there was certainly an element of 
trying to ban a substance associated with an immigrant group that was competing with the native labor force for jobs and houses and all those sorts of things. That sort of waned after a, a few years or decade. Several decades later, there was another wave in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s that also waned. And then still a third wave of, again, state-level prohibitions okay, across the U.S. in many states, uh, partially, again, driven by anti-immigration feelings, uh, starting around 1910 to 1900 to 1910. And that third wave sort of built and built and seemed to have momentum. But at that point, the prohibitionists and anti-prohibitionists finally agreed on one thing, which is the prohibition would not have much effect on alcohol consumption unless it was done at the national level. State borders were far too porous. The state level prohibition laws were far too permissive by say, permitting large amounts of home production of alcohol and things that allowed people to circumvent the rules. And so there was a combination of this buildup of support. There was maybe the moral certainty that was generated by World War I or the feeling that everything was under attack and so that led to the national prohibition law in 1920. Um, so the factors were the longstanding religious opposition to alcohol, but as well uh, waves of immigration that somehow scared people and made them want to uh, prohibit something associated with the immigrant groups that were coming in at the time. In the 1900s and 1910s, it was Italians who were thought of as being high drinking. And that was an important factor in why we finally got national prohibition. <laughs> There are other factors that you also have to take into consideration. There was the issue of children and families that people were concerned about the harm done by alcohol to uh, children and families. The focus on saloons as a gathering place for men who would, instead of going home to uh, buy groceries would uh, stop at the saloon and buy booze. Prohibition uh, was also uh, predicted by the fact that uh, not just Irish, but also Germans uh, just before World War I. Uh, and then the other issue is it took on the uh, uh, concerns of things like the Ku Klux Klan uh, and an effort to keep uh, African Americans and, and then subsequently Hispanics from um, um, drinking alcohol. And some of this was pre presaged by the uh, 1914 Harrison Narcotics Act uh, targeting, uh, uh, quote, illegal substances like marijuana and opium, opium for Chinese on the West Coast, uh, marijuana for African Americans in the South and uh, Hispanics in the uh, Southwest. So prohibition became sort of this uh, witch's brew for all things hostile to whoever your favorite uh, 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 enemy was or your favorite uh, uh, cause was. So there were some legitimate aspects of it because there was an issue of health effects and families and domestic violence. But there are other issues in terms of uh, stoking fear and xenophobia. So it, it represented a, a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, but in the end, even those people who opposed uh, other people drinking, Many of them were drinkers themselves, particularly in the South, where they just didn't want African Americans drinking, but they were drinking themselves. So it became uh, sort of this farce uh, that perpetrated on the American public. So was it was it assumed by those people that the law wouldn't touch them? Was it that the law that actually came about with the Volstead Act was more severe than they expected, or were they expecting to be hypocrites or and lawbreakers when it came in? Well, in that effect, was it was just that. If, they, uh, if you were middle class or rich, the law, even the Volstead Act didn't touch you. If you were poor white or African American, the law ultimately, that's where they got their, most of their arrests and most of the fines. Uh, uh, so it turns out that uh, Prohibition and the Volstead Act highlighted these class differences in America. Uh, and as Prohibition unfolded, and Jeffrey can comment on that, uh, if you could go to speakeasies, if you could go to uh, uh, certain clubs, you basically weren't touched. If you couldn't do that, boom, you, you got busted. Uh, homes were broken into during Prohibition, the Fourth Amendment in the United States against the illegal search of Caesars. Those are issues that uh, surface. Uh, so uh, the antecedents of Prohibition suddenly uh, fell into uh, dis disarray because basically the law was uh, unevenly uh, applied. If you were poor, white, 
or if you are a person of color, you were subject to the reach of prohibition. If you weren't, then you were not. You could bribe judges if you were rich and upper middle class. Uh, you didn't have that option if you were poor. Yeah, and obvious parallels, of course, with the with the war on drugs, which began around about the same time. Um, we, we often hear um, economists mainly use the, the term bootleggers and Baptists. Um, does somebody want to just explain that concept and, and uh, its roots in prohibition? Jamie? Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I could, but I suspect Jeffrey will be much better placed to do yeah. that. He'd know the history much better than me. Uh, the bootleggers and Baptists idea is that many policies, not just prohibition, but prohibition is certainly a great example, have two kinds of support. On the one hand, they get support from people who are trying to do good or think they're promoting the general welfare by imposing a particular lifestyle on people, keeping them from using or misusing alcohol. But they also end up being supported. And so those, of course, are, are the Baptist in that uh, framework. But they're also supported by the bootleggers, the people who profit from having the law in place. Prohibition at one level is this giant barrier to entry against producing alcohol at a competitive price for people who are unwilling to break the law, for people who don't want to and have to engage in the violence you would engage in if you manufacture and distribute in an illegal industry, in an underground industry. So you can think of zillions of other examples, but it's the confluence of the sort of self-interested and the do-gooders that leads to these policies, which um, end up in, in my view and most of the, in the panel's view, all sorts of negatives that were unintended and then desired uh, by the Baptists who originally proposed the policies. And to yeah. stay, stay, oh sorry, go on. So, oh, me, I was going to come in. The, um, Don Boudreau and, and somebody else uh, wrote an a, a academic paper about this and they described what the Baptist side of this arrangement, it's not an arrangement, but making of this process, he described what they do as moral rent seeking. So they you know, a normal commercial rent seeker is trying to get some commercial favor from the government, a regulation that favors their company or something. These people are seeking to use the state to have, um, to make people live according to their moral vision. And so, but they act very much in the same way as a normal commercial rent seeker. They, you know, they lobby, they fund certain politicians, they do all the kinds of things that you normally associate with, you know, the corruption of the political process when it's being done commercially. Uh, I think it's no less corrupt when it's being done to impose uh, your, your moral vision on people who don't share it. Right. And um, as I said in the introduction, prohibition has almost become a, a byword for, for failure and um, you know, the, the over, overreaching utopian visions from, from, the, uh, from the government down. But you do from time to time hear a sort of revisionist view of it, as it were. There was an article in the Times by David Aronovich, for example, last year, which basically said, look, don't be, don't be fooled by the, um, by the propaganda, actually, prohibition was a success. And if you look at the statistics, alcohol consumption did decline, and there were declines in, um, in liver cirrhosis rates, for example. Now, Jeff, and I know you in particular, I think I first came across um, your work when I was researching prohibition and, and saw your study looking at what happened to alcohol consumption, which, of course, is based on uh, presumably quite a lot of estimates um, but you've also written about prohibition and homicide so what were what are the facts um, have we been overlooking certain benefits or was it as bad as people make out so I think the advocates of prohibition are quite right to suggest that under standard economic models you would expect prohibition to reduce the consumption the use of the prohibited commodity and I think the pro-legalization or the anti-prohibition crowd sometimes gets a little overexcited and asserts that prohibitions not only have all the negative effects of generating black markets and crime, but they don't even reduce consumption of the prohibited commodity of alcohol or drugs or whatever. Now, on the basis of a priori theory, you would expect there to be some reduction. In the case of alcohol prohibition in the U.S., my estimates were basically, which were basically looking at what happened to the cirrhosis death rate. Because of course, during alcohol prohibition, we didn't have official data on alcohol consumption because at an official level, it didn't exist. So it wasn't measured and data weren't collected. Those data suggest that there was something like a 20% decline 
okay, in the consumption of alcohol between the 20 and 33, and years 1920 to 33. People who look at the cirrhosis death rate and just say, gee, it seemed to have gone down a ton, are missing the fact, the fact that's sort of related to our current discussion, which is there was an enormous epidemic in 1918, 1919, the Spanish influenza, which killed a huge number of people and took a bunch of people out of the population at risk of dying from cirrhosis. So if you do some sort of sensible standard statistical things to correct for that, you don't see a 50 or a 75% decline. You estimate, guesstimate something like a 20% decline. So the people who are pushing back are certainly right to say we probably reduced alcohol consumption somewhat. At the same time, the data suggests very clearly that crime rates, homicide rates in particular, went up quite substantially. So that's, of course, a negative that has to be integrated into the overall discussion. And then finally, I would say we shouldn't take as given that reducing consumption of the prohibited commodity is a good thing. If we could reduce driving under the influence where people are driving erratically and cause accidents, of course, that would be a good thing. If we reduce the drinking that leads to domestic violence, that would be a good thing. But if we prevent me from having a glass of red wine with my dinner, okay, that shouldn't be a good thing. That should be, that should be none of the government's business. And that 20% decline in alcohol consumption we observed, undoubtedly some of that was from people who were reasonable, moderate consumers of alcohol. And so that should have been regarded, that part should have been regarded as a cost of prohibition, not a benefit of prohibition. Yeah, we, we've seen something similar in Scotland over the last couple of years because the minimum pricing for alcohol has come in in Scotland and right. people are trying to piece together the, the evidence and it's, it's far from a, a perfect uh, picture yet. But from the scraps of evidence, it doesn't seem to have any obvious benefit to health and so instead the conversation has gone has turned to oh well, we think there's been a sort of a six percent reduction in sales it's like well you it's not surprising i guess that if you put the price up you, you see sales fall and lower demand but that that's not really the primary objective it might get you to your objective but if you're not actually achieving objective it doesn't really um it's not really something to celebrate um the question for any of you here um were there any benefits? I mean, mostly you spoke about the, the domestic violence. I and mean, There's no doubt that people were drinking, by modern standards, a, a huge amount uh, before the, certainly before the First World War. Um, were there any benefits from, from prohibition, even from the kind of, if you want to call it, the narrow perspective of health? I, I think as Jeffrey uh, uh, portrayed it, yeah, there are some benefits. The question really is, are those benefits outweighed by the harms? So if you are no longer safe in your house because you've got law enforcement uh, breaking down your doors because they suspect that you have a, a, a quart of gin or a quart of whiskey or beer in your house and it turns out you don't, but because you've also created a whole squadron of spies in the community. <laughs> and so the community is becoming an Orwellian community. Uh, is that price, is the price acceptable? And many would argue that it isn't. And again, from a um, uh, ethnic minority perspective, it was not acceptable. Basically, people were being chased down, literally shot, uh, simply because uh, <clears throat> law enforcement was running um, uh, unchecked. And then the expansion in government, the, the cost of having this enterprise where we enforce this law that uh, really doesn't have uh, as much popular support as its uh, proponents would argue, then where's that money coming from? And then ultimately, yes, we had the Spanish flu, we had the war, uh, but we wound up having the, the Great Depression. So there's these other externalities that occur that were unanticipated and you saw the price that you paid for this decision. Finally, there are alternatives to something like absolute prohibition that could have been tried, but weren't being tried. Uh, those who wanted absolute prohibition weren't satisfied with the pace of change with these alternatives. They wanted the sort of uh, imposition of our values on the whole nation, uh, regardless of whether the balance was 55, 45, or 50, 50. Uh, the, those who had the votes could care less about the impact. So, it creates a country where you're living in that you're balancing all these stakeholder issues and benefits and the costs, and it turns out the cost outweighed the benefits.
Chris, yeah. can I come in here? Yeah, please do. Uh, I mean, th this question, do the costs, what are the costs and the benefits of the prohibition? Or another way of just thinking about it is what are the costs and benefits of drinking? Right? Yeah. So, uh, now, we, we are falling, I don't think anybody in the panel really is, but the nature of this discussion, it's as if there is such a thing as the benefit of drinking and the cost of drinking. And we can work all that out, sitting at a distance from the people involved. And of course, that's impossible. The benefits of drinking vary between different drinkers or different people, and so do the costs. In fact, some effects of drinking uh, a cost for one person and a benefit for another, depending on the preferences of those people. So, for example, if you get if you go out and get absolutely hammered, um, all sorts of things, random kind of things might happen. You might wake up somewhere strange. Now, some people think that's one of the upsides of, of getting drunk, and other people think it's one of the downsides of getting drunk. There's really no saying uh, in general terms for everybody what's a benefit and what's a, what's a cost. Some people don't care much about their health, maybe for good reason, maybe they're dying of something else. Uh, you, you can't work this stuff out at a distance. So you've got to leave it to the people involved. There's an argument for interfering where there are externalities or spillover costs that other people get. But it's very important to realize that almost all of those uh, spillover costs um, are uh, accepted voluntarily by the people who experience them. So for example, if you take smoking as a different example, uh, I don't have to live with a smoker if I don't want to. I can yell at him and say, stop smoking. Uh, I don't have to go to smoky bars. I don't. All the people who passively smoke, right? They're actively passively smoking. It's up to them whether they get that derivative smoke in them. And there's no need for the government. So these kinds of spillovers are not the kind of spillovers that need government action uh, to stop. We can all individually stop them if we want. So there's no cause whatsoever to governments, for governments to get involved in this stuff, even if their goal is to maximize benefits over costs. Yeah. Well, uh, secondary, secondhand smoke is a, a real issue. And if you're a child in that environment, you don't have a lot of options. If you're in an apartment or in a tenement house where people are smoking and that's all you can afford, you don't have a lot of options. But I agree with you, there are alternative strategies that should be employed when you're trying to change behavior. The notion of prohibition as a panacea for all that ails you is, I think, a dysfunctional uh, but, notion. You but have to take into consideration stakeholders, uh, all the stakeholders in a phenomena in order to uh, come up with uh, an acceptable strategy. Someone who's drunk in driving is not an acceptable condition because uh, so in ethics, there's this whole notion of sort of anticipating the negative consequences and the negative consequences start to rise very high. So you don't want to wait until you've got this uh, uh, event to occur. You're trying to prevent it. Uh, uh, you can absolutely prevent drinking as a possible solution that would prevent somebody else from doing it. But is that a reasonable thing? And the issue turns out uh, no, because the community pushes back. The stakeholders are the people in the community. Prohibition was about the populace and the people who use the political process to negotiate an economic solution or a political or legal solution fail to take into consideration the people because the people start pushing back. And that's what you're seeing in the pandemic. At some point, people go to the beaches. They say, forget what public health has got to say, we're up. So the issue is trust. If we use prohibition, if we use the pandemic as an excuse to impose prohibition, then we undermine both our public health concerns about the pandemic and the public health concerns about uh, 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 alcohol consumption. The point is you need to use the appropriate strategy to deal with the problem and you have to take into consideration the stakeholders because when the people start speaking, the whole thing starts to fall apart. And that's well, consistent with what you're saying, Jamie. And you very nicely brought us on to the, to the present day. So we've done the history. Let's now talk about the, the current lockdown prohibitions. Now, I am not an expert on the internal politics of Panama or Greenland, and I dare say neither, none of you are either. But um, there have been a number of countries, as I mentioned in the introduction, that have introduced them, notably India and, and South Africa, both of which have gone beyond mere um, closing down bars and pubs, which Britain has done, gone beyond even the sale of uh, alcohol from shops, but also 
uh, banned the sale of e-cigarettes and tobacco too. Um, now, my suspicion is that this is just something that a few people in government and public health have always rather like to do and have uh, seized on the opportunity um, while everybody's, uh, you know, sacrificing their liberties left, right and centre. Um, do you think that's fair or are there other good justifications that are being given by the governments that, that do stack up? Could it help um, tackle COVID-19 in any significant way? Anybody, that one. I'm not, I'm not a medical expert, so I shouldn't comment, but I do have this impression that some part of the public health community would like to argue that consuming alcohol makes everything else worse. It increases your risk of every disease. It makes your susceptibility to everything. And so this was a perfect opportunity for them to say, see, we were been trying to tell you people should consume less alcohol. And so now we should use this opportunity to try to keep people to consume less alcohol. It makes me nervous for lots of reasons. One is I would have thought that forcing people who are significantly addicted to alcohol to in effect go cold turkey or have to access by the black market could be a serious risk uh, to such people. And that on top of that, the claim that there was any particular social distancing risk from allowing liquor stores to sell alcohol for pickup uh, kind of activity as opposed to roaming around the stores didn't seem to be any different than in the grocery store. So I don't, I'm not aware of any good reason why we should have particularly picked on alcohol. I'll just mention as sort of interesting in Massachusetts, the triumph of inconsistency, we let the liquor stores stay open even under the most severe lockdowns. And we let the medical marijuana stores stay open under the lockdowns, but not the retail marijuana stores. How you can make sense of that is totally beyond me. Well, we've, uh, the, the alcohol shops in Britain have been officially classified as essential services. So uh, <laughs> that's a, 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 one good thing about uh, our lockdown. Wesley, I mean, it's an interesting point there about what would happen with dependent drinkers. As far as I can see, they, there've been a couple of official explanations for banning the sale of alcohol. One is that, this is mainly from South Africa, if you allow people to get drunk, then they will disobey the social distancing, which I guess is plausible. The other is a, I guess, broader argument saying, well, alcohol affects the immune system and it could make you more um, susceptible to the coronavirus. Do you think these are plausible arguments, let alone strong enough ones to justify prohibition? And also if you can just uh, take on the, the point about dependent drinkers. Okay, you can look at the, the epidemiology of uh, alcohol in, in a particular country. So I won't second guess the public health authorities in the country in terms of the prevalence of uh, dysfunctional alcohol consumption, binge drinking, or, or, and, and that sort of thing. But we have to keep in mind that alcohol didn't cause the pandemic. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 did. And when you're using uh, uh, COVID-19 as a justification to, prohi to prohibit alcohol consumption, you diminish the trust that public health must have in order to address COVID-19. So if you start confusing things, then what happens is uh, people start pushing back. So you've got stay at home orders, you've got the economic sh shutdown, you got civil rights curtailment, you got health disparities, you got disparities in the economy. So all those things highlight the disparate impact of, uh, of the COVID-19 policies, which you necessarily have to have, but then you throw in alcohol and say, well, alcohol is to blame, then it suggests that you've got another agenda. Uh, and that other agenda gets back to what Jeffrey said, uh, uh, bootleggers and adapters, because you wind up having a bootleggers, as it were, um, uh, start to coming in. And even in South Africa, they've got people bringing in alcohol from across the borders. They've got complaints of, of police reactions, et cetera, et cetera. So you create that distrust. And, and then people start, the various stakeholders start piecing together their grievances. And within the aggregate, they wind up undermining the uh, stay at home orders. They wind up undermining uh, the need to uh, get testing. They wind up undermining the, their, their, their faith in the public health strategies because there's an additional agenda. As was pointed out, people start asking, what are we gonna do after the pandemic subsides? Are we gonna keep some of these things in place? Are we gonna use this as a smoke screen for the justification for an erosion of civil liberties? What are we going to do? And in part, that takes the focus off of the pandemic. It shifts the focus to, in this case, alcohol.
Yeah, and while it is plausible, I guess, that if, if people are drinking a lot, then they might you know, forget that they're supposed to stay two metres away from one another. Uh, the reality has been that people are, as you would expect, buying on the black market, and that means buying from strangers in the street and probably doing uh, rather less socially di social distancing than you otherwise would. So always, you know, once again, unintended consequences. Um, Jamie, do you think my suspicion is right that this is a case of not letting a, a crisis go to waste? In a way, US prohibition took advantage of a crisis. It was the, the First World War, which um, allowed the government to bring in temporary, supposedly temporary restrictions on, on the manufacture of, of alcohol. Um, uh, is this a, a, a common problem that you, uh, you, you have an emergency and then you, you, you have legislation which never goes away? Well, it's such a common problem that you can read several books about it. The one I recommend is Robert Higgs's book, um, um, Crisis and Leviathan, in which he, he develops, I think, it wasn't his idea, but he develops it most fully, that the growth of government mainly happens via crises. So they, they make a, they enlarge the role of the state in our lives during the crisis, claiming that this is just for the temporary period of the crisis, like they say, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, and so on. And then after these crises go away, the government does contract a little from the crisis period, but not back to where it was before the crisis. And so you get a ratchet effect where government just grows and grows and grows. I mean, a UK example, uh, Higgs looks at the United States, the UK example was uh, rent controls were introduced during World War I because prices were going up. I don't know why the demand for housing had increased during the war. They introduced it explicitly just for the period of the war. In fact, I think the last rent controls in the United Kingdom were removed in 1989. So it lasted a lot longer. Uh, and I think you're dead right. I think the, the, in a crisis, you can make this argument. Um, normally, people should be free to make decisions for themselves about various things. But we have to suspend that for now because there is something so urgent, so important, that uh, it would be irresponsible to allow people to, to make trade-offs for themselves. They've got to come in line with the national cause, right? like for making sure we're not occupied by Germany or whatever it might be. And so people who would like to impose controls on people, hype up crises, make them, you know, do everything to magnify them and tell you you must, um, you must toe the line. Uh, there's a little something I'm very worried about which has happened in my native New Zealand. New Zealand had a very, has had a very strict, well, it's not really, they've had a lockdown, but they also closed the borders. And so the disease didn't really take in New Zealand at all. They've had, they don't, they have alert levels. So they've gone from alert level four to three and they're now on two. They introduced legislation. When they moved from level three down to two, this legislation allows the police to enter your house without a warrant if they suspect that there are more than 10 people in it. Right? Really? Now, <laughs> I, I think that it's going to be very, and the population's gone along with this and there's been no legal challenge. I, I think that it's, if, if having 10, the police suspect you of having 10 people in your house, and remember the, the virus is not in New Zealand. It's not really in the population at the moment anyway, right? So they brought in this law and I'm very, very worried that the ability of the police to enter your home will be permanently, without a warrant, will be permanently extended now. This kind of thing happens all the time. Yeah, nothing so permanent as a temporary government program, as yeah. uh, Norman Friedman said. It Anybody else want to come in on that? It happened uh, during Prohibition, particularly, uh, again, uh, for poor people and poor people of color. Uh, the Fourth Amendment essentially got suspended, and all I had to do was suspect that you were a bootlegger or that you were selling. And in some cases, even if you had booze for consum personal consumption, I could knock down your door and literally people were killed uh, trying to defend their homes or they were surprised. At, and it's still happening actually in the United States. We wind up having police having bad information. And, you know, you're asleep in your bed and somebody starts <laughs> knocking down your door. You stand up, you get shot. So we have to be careful uh, about the diminution of civil liberties because what we're trying to cultivate is respect for authority, respect, respect for the legitimate role of the state. And you can't get that when the, that expansion uh, undermines the, the role of the state. If you look at Lisa McGregor, uh, book, McGurr's book, The War on Alcohol, she also talks about yeah. the rise of the American state and the, uh, the legacy of prohibition. So you, you do have those concerns. There are all these trade-offs. How important to you 
are your constitutional rights? How important to you is the sanctity of your home? Uh, how do you balance that with concerns with your health? And I think that's what uh, Jamie was implying, that individuals have to be a part of the decision-making process. They are stakeholders in the outcome. So the, the, how do you balance risk in life is an individual thing. We have to, we can't just impose these risk assessment protocols on people because we know, quote, we know what's best for them. And that turns out to be uh, a, something that bootleggers love because in the, I guess the Baptists love it too, because it gives people places to influence other people. I can impose my decisions on you. Then and, and once prohibition was re repealed in 1933, of course things didn't go back to how they were um, in, the, in the 1910s. And uh, some people do say that there were, there, were, there were improvements, you had more women going to bars, bars become, became more sort of gentrified. The old school saloon pretty much did die out. Um, in terms of sort of regulation and legislation, uh, and maybe even taxation, what, what, what was a change between uh, the sort of drinking culture and drinking environment in the 1930s as opposed to before the First World War? In terms, of in terms of regulation and taxation, the repeal of federal prohibition and of the Vol federal Volstead Act didn't prevent any state and to some degree lower levels of government, cities or counties from continuing any kind of regulation, even prohibitions uh, that they might have wanted. So they basically all have continued heavy taxation of alcohol, as has the federal government. The prohibitions didn't go away in a number of states until several decades later last was Mississippi in 1966. It still officially outlawed alcohol until, you know, 10 years after I was born, uh, it, it sort of stunningly enough. And they had this brilliant defense of why it was the right thing to do, even while during that period they were collecting taxes on the illegal alcohol sales. So it was sort of a, the perfect storm of government hypocrisy. You and still had course, counties after that time period that were, quote, dry counties. You still, still do, yeah. Yeah. Right. And in fact, uh, someone did a study, uh, Fernandez, I think, did a study on a dry county in Kentucky and found that while the alcohol related problems de decrease, methamphetamine labs increase. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the confluence of drugs and alcohol, the completely unrelated uh, activities wound up surfacing. So you've got this issue of if you don't reach the people, if you don't get the heart of the people, then they respond uh, the way they're responding. So that you had more during this time period, it was to, uh, 2010, more meth labs in the dry counties than you had in the wet counties. The reason I ask that question is because it brings me to my final question really before we go to the Q&A, um, which is uh, what, what are, if any, the long-term effects of these prohibitions going to be? And as I say, I don't expect you to know all about the, the politics of, of Panama and what have you. But what do you think is likely to happen? Is it simply the case that once the pandemic is cleared or there's a vaccine, um, everything will just go back to how it was? People will accept that it was a, it was a very strange um, and panicky time? Or do you think there will be at least some lasting effect that some kind of restrictions on licensing will come in? In, New in Delhi, for example, um, although they've now got rid of the prohibition, they put a 70% tax on alcohol, um, ostensibly because they want to reduce the amount of queuing outside bottle shops. Um, that sounds to me like the kind of tax that might hang around for a few years. Uh, I'll just say quickly, I would certainly expect many of these restrictions or higher taxes to persist in a lot of places because as we've discussed, there's a constituency and has been for centuries to reduce or eliminate alcohol consumption. And so now that there's this at least superficially uh, convincing new reason to do it, I think that is likely to last for a while. But I would emphasize that we, it's not all bleak because in at least a few places, the temporary measures that have been undertaken have been in the direction of more freedom. So in order to allow for more social distancing in the purchase of alcohol, some states have legalized home delivery, which was not legal in those states beforehand. So that does give people a, a new option and a more, an easier way to consume alcohol um, that maybe will persist as well. So maybe it's not all bad. <laughs> 
And back to the issue of extremely high taxes, then you've got incentives for alternatives to the uh, main um, avenues of production. And also a production that is out of reach of the regulatory and public health authorities. Uh, you saw that, you mentioned that in Mexico, there have been a couple of deaths in uh, South Africa. Uh, during prohibition, there were a lot of deaths, uh, some estimate thousands of deaths because people were producing products that were not uh, uh, clean. Um, so they had uh, uh, methanol in it, they had uh, uh, other substances in it. So the additives. So if indeed you make the taxes so high to encourage bootlegging and alternative manufacturing, then you actually wind up threatening the public health. So remember, you can make your own. <laughs> it doesn't take much to make your own alcohol. What it takes is the, did you do it right? And that's the problem. And people start taking the risk. Well, I assume Mr. Jones knows that he did it right. Uh, Mr. Jones may or may not have done it right. Uh, methanol is a byproduct of uh, alcohol production. It needs to be removed from the alcohol. If it's not done, it could, then you get poisoned. Uh, some people add methanol as a, an additive, you get poisoned. There are other materials, depending upon how you use your equipment, you get poisoned. Uh, that is an issue that people have to, the public health has to balance with public policy and the public policy has to balance with the interests of the people. And there were another two deaths actually in South Africa yesterday from people drinking uh, moonshine. Jamie, do you want to add anything to that? I've got a question that I'd probably direct to you if not. All right, just direct the question. Okay, well, I say direct to you because it's a, it's a UK-focused question. Um, somebody's asked, what does the panel think about Boris's apparent conversion to the nanny state? Could that lead to more prohibition and or restrictions? I should explain... Boris Johnson, who you probably know, gentleman, was uh, was in hospital quite fairly seriously ill with um, the coronavirus a few weeks ago. Uh, he is quite overweight. There clearly is a link between obesity and COVID complications. And he seems convinced that uh, he would have been all right and wouldn't have to go into intensive care had he not been obese and is now uh, threatening to have a renewed war on obesity. Uh, policy details to be confirmed. Right. Well, it, it, one, just before I get on to the substance of it, it's, it always irritates me enormously when politicians have some personal experience and then decide that public policy must change for everybody on account of their personal experience. You know, there were plenty of fat people having health problems two years ago, right? And just because it happens to him, now everything's got to change. So there's a kind of egomania in it, uh, which is offensive. So let's get that out of the way. Um, I think that the NHS has always been a threat to our liberty and it's extremely, it, it, it actually surprises me that we haven't seen more attacks on our liberty on account of the NHS. Whenever I go on panel shows or whatever, get interviewed, uh, when there's some kind of nanny state proposal coming forward and I say, you know, people need to make these decisions for themselves because the right trade-off depends on their preferences and the costs and benefits that they therefore experience. People say to me, oh, no, 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 but hang on, they impose costs on other people because through the NHS, the, the, their ill health is actually an external cost for other people. And that's right. There's a logic to that. You know that. So if you have a system where I have to pay for your health problems, then I must have a say in how you live because you might get unhealthy and impose a cost on me. And that, is, there's a perf that makes perfect sense. And so the state said, no, no, we can't have people just eating whatever they want or eating sugar. And there's a, there's a perfect logic to it. And now that Boris Johnson, I think that Boris Johnson's becoming a nanny status, not so much because of his personal experience, but because he has invested so much in the NHS now. I mean, nobody you know, he put it on the bus, the Brexit bus. He went on, he goes on and on and on about it. The Tories have really embraced the NHS. And once you've done that, You've embraced nanny statism or the logic of it. So I, I don't see any way out of this because there's certainly, I mean, the chances of us reforming the NHS are, are much smaller than they were a year ago. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't see any, any stopping this. It's a bloody disaster, but I think it's happening. Okay, thanks. 
Um, another question, Jeff's kind of already touched on this. Uh, somebody's asked, will any countries introduce a permanent relaxation of nanny state laws as a result of the pandemic? The, I think it's the American Enterprise Institute have been running a sort of hashtag never needed uh, series recently in which it looks, they, they've been looking at all the laws just in America that have been repealed or relaxed as a result of COVID-19. Last time I checked last week, they were up to something like 480 of them. And uh, quite a su substantial number of them are related to alcohol, allowing mail order alcohol, allowing curbside alcohol, allowing takeouts, and so on. And it does seem, at least to me, that these laws were never really needed in the first place. In Britain, we've uh, changed the law, I think, to allow pubs to do food deliveries, which seems like the kind of thing they could have reasonably done before. So I guess the question is, um, have you got any other examples of this? But also, am I being a hypocrite if I say that I think it's wonderful that the, the, the crisis has led to these relaxations and I hope they, uh, they stay off the statute books while condemning people who are using the crisis to push through prohibition and, uh, uh, and, and keeping it on afterwards? I, I, at least in the US, I think a fair position is to recognize that all three major groups, conservatives, what we call conservatives, what we call liberals, which is of course different than the historical British liberal, modern liberals, and libertarians, all three groups have used this crisis to push the agendas that they had before there was a crisis. So of course, libertarians, free marketeers, et cetera, are pointing to all the ways in which pre-existing regulation has made things worse and more difficult. but. I think we're totally entitled to do that. The advocates of bigger government, of say a bigger social safety net, point to the fact that there's going to be this huge recession that we're just sort of seeing the beginnings of and say, see, we told you we need a more generous social safety net. They're of course allowed to make such arguments, but we will push back. And so at the end of the day, I think we will still be making the same, having the same discussions and arguing the same pros and cons and it's incumbent upon people in, in this group or people who want less government and more liberty to figure out new ways to make it more convincing because, as, so as Jamie was saying, we're not making progress in that direction in a lot of cases. Um, but I don't think you're being a hypocrite to say this shows that some of those things were bad in the first place. If that's what we believe, then that's what we should argue. I have no, no issue with that. I'm not a critic of the, the social safety net. Uh, I do think that when it comes to big government or unnecessary rules and regulations that encroach upon people's freedoms and liberties, um, that those things should be examined. So this, for the academy, this, the uh, post-pandemic period would be an opportunity to study the impact of a lot of these things. And they do need to be seriously considered, but all the stakeholders who have an interest in the outcome need to be actively involved in the process because they have to be owners of it. Otherwise, you wind up getting, um, as I keep saying over and over, you get pushed back from the people. Um, the government winds up having to modify its position. Then you get this hodgepodge of uh, strategies often which are inefficient and ineffective. Um, actually, Sweden's interesting here, isn't it? Because you've got, so we, I think probably is agreement on the panel about we don't want pointless regulations that interfere with people's liberty. Um, a lot of libertarians, uh, some libertarians at least, are more comfortable with a social safety net. Um, and Sweden's interesting because, you know, a lot of the IEA is always pointing out that Sweden isn't quite the place that many socialists seem to think it is. It's a very liberal country with a high rate of transfers, ta high taxes and social payments. But otherwise, the state doesn't play a huge role. Uh, in people's lives. And isn't it interesting that they didn't impose a lockdown? Um, that, that really uh, shows a, a, the distinctive kind of position of Sweden. And I must say, if I, I mean, you know, I, I probably want lower taxes. I do want lower taxes than Sweden has. But I would much prefer to live under the Swedish model than the British model. And the Swedish model shifted the risk to the people. Um, they did have a disproportionate number of deaths. The early data suggested not, but the later data points out that they in fact did have their fair share of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, positive people at deaths. Uh, nevertheless, the question is who bears the brunt of whatever the policy is. So if you don't, if the people prefer to accept risk 
in their environment while preserving their freedoms and their liberties and their opportunities, then government has to uh, go along with that. If you've got a highly paternalistic environment where I'm going to insulate you from all risk, then I'm actually being disingenuous because you can't insulate me from all risk. And that is part of this whole thing about the the nanny state and about excess paternalism is that the assumption is that you can immunize people against all the risks in their environment. Uh, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, okay, I've got a question now, see if anybody wants to take it on. We see international bodies, the World Health Organization, the OECD, uh, and so on, uh, plus health ministries backing the Baptists and corrupt politicians, the bootleggers. In addition to the IA, who are likely to be the most effective proponents on a global scale for drinkers? Wow, wow. <laughs> the, Any suggestions? The, the alcohol industry. <laughs> the global alcohol industry seems like the uh, best bet, yeah. And the people. The people are a good advocate. Yeah, I think the people are a good advocate. Uh, yeah. I mean, drinkers, drinking, not always. I, mean, it was a, I can't remember who said it uh, in the course of, it was during Prohibition. Somebody said that the prohibitionists had been uh, planning prohibition for a hundred years, where the, whereas the drinkers hadn't been doing anything; they were too busy drinking, and uh, it always puts puts them in a slight disadvantage. <laughs> you know, I remember the, prohibition lasted for thirteen years. That's true. It took them a hundred years to impose a constitutional amendment that lasted for thirteen. Sure it's the only constitutional amendment in the United States that's it's ever been. Gone. Yeah. So <laughs> you can mobile, people can get mobilized. Uh, and there were a lot of changes uh, that were uh, predicted by prohibition, suffrage for women, uh, women quote, being liberated. Uh, the saloons were basically 95% uh, male and suddenly uh, women were uh, a part of the new drinking culture uh, as people assumed greater responsibility for themselves. And it's, set the path, one would even argue that uh, prohibition was sort of the birthing grounds for the, the uh, uh, women liberation. <laughs> well, sure, yeah, yeah. Paul if you want to think of it in those terms. You know, in New Zealand, um, there was a temperance movement um, that was getting quite strong uh, just before the Second World War and during it. Five referendums, I think. In, yeah, in New Zealand, up until very recently, uh, every general election, you had not only you do the normal voting for the in the general election, they always had a little a referendum attached to it every time uh, on prohibition. I can't remember when that stopped, but I, I, I voted. I certainly voted uh, on that question. Really? This is in your lifetime? This yes, was. yes. Wow. Um, and in fact, I remember there was a campaign one year um, telling people who wanted to legal, because nobody voted, by, by the time I voted on it, nobody ever ticked the box, right? But some people said, if you want marijuana to be legalized, tick the prohibition box. And so it's a signal. Uh, and so they got quite a lot of votes. It's a but dangerous game it, to play, I would have thought. <laughs> but there's this thing with women and men is very interesting about prohibition because the, uh, the, pro the polls were showing that prohibition was going to win. It was going to be around in the 1940s, late 40s, I think, or mid 40s. And then what, that was when all the men were off overseas fighting in World War II. And when they came back, uh, young men, they, they swamped the result the other way. So with prohibition didn't get through, they voted it out. Um, which brings me back to the present, which I think what thing that's interesting, you see young people in Britain, at least, I think, don't drink as much as uh, we used to. Uh, yeah. And yet there's been a little, but they smoke a lot of dope. And you see the laws changing to favor, at least in America, and I think it will come here. Uh, you know, there's been a liberalization around marijuana. Actually, smoking so less maybe, of that as well, in fact, actually. Young people yeah, aren't so, doing anything, really. But may, maybe uh, alcohol, uh, you, the people, I, in Britain, of course, people like to drink, and I think there'd be, I, I can't really imagine prohibition coming in here. But they're happy with the taxes and so on. And part of the problem we may have is that the younger, gener us, us old drinkers may have, is that the younger voters don't really care much about drinking, or not as much as we do, and they may not defend alcohol as, as uh, vigorously as they should. That's a, it's a scary thought, yeah. Um, On the other hand, they do make those other choices, as you, as you pointed out. And it does push the industry to explore alternatives also. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. So no alcohol beer and low alcohol beer and uh, waters, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things. 
The United States, marijuana, as you pointed out, JB, uh, has become an issue. We have 11 states that have legalized recreational marijuana, 33 states that, uh, including those 11, that have medicinal marijuana. And then that operates in conflict with the Controlled Substances Act, which is the federal level uh, marijuana act. So uh, you've got this uh, federal versus state uh, uh, tension that's uh, being resolved ostensibly in favor of liberalizing the rules on, on, on marijuana. Um, Angela has asked, will the tax man win out over the public health man in most countries ultimately? And in a way, it leads on from what you were just saying, uh, not only about uh, prohibition, because it wasn't just about people being mobilized that it, it collapsed. It was the, the Wall Street crash, the need to get tax revenue um, and alcohol, you know, the, the, the lack of alcohol revenue really had put, put a big hole in the budget. And also, I think I, I would certainly argue that one of the main reasons so many U.S. states have been legalizing marijuana isn't from some kind of libertarian principle, but because they can make uh, quite a lot of money out of taxing it. So but I'll just repeat the question. Will the tax man uh, win out over the public health man when it comes to these issues? I think it's I think it's very hard to predict because we've seen examples that are suggestive of these tax, the desire for the tax revenues uh, be fairly important and seem to win the day. And yet we can also find a bunch of examples where I think puzzlingly that argument is not sufficiently strong to carry the day. So one of the main reasons that the US repealed alcohol prohibition in 19, early 1930s was because the Great Depression had occurred. The, the macroeconomic thinking at the time was that it was important to balance the budget. And so the federal government needed a new source of tax revenue and therefore wanted to legalize alcohol in order to tax it and help to balance the budget. Now the macroeconomics of that time are now viewed as completely backwards, but at the time that sort of made sense. And so that was important for repeal. And yet we have all these other substances, marijuana until relatively recently, other illegal drugs and so on, that have continued to be illegal, despite the fact that there's lots of potential to raise substantial tax revenue from legalizing them, indeed much more than from marijuana, given the price structure for other illegal drugs. So it seems that lots of other factors weigh in, um, and the tax issue is one that is used by the advocates for legalization, and it probably helps a bit, but it doesn't seem to carry the day by any stretch. Well, the marijuana lobby was a little uh, focused not just on taxes. Uh, early in the effort, they focused on the medical aspect of it. And the United States government created a paradox. They argued that there was no research to support the utility of marijuana for medical purposes, but they refused to fund the research to discover whether there was some utility to uh, uh, medical marijuana. So what the marijuana industry did was create their own quote, research. Um, for instance, CBD, it turned out to be a useful medication for a seizure disorder. So as of December 2018, uh, uh, CBD was removed from the uh, illegal substances part of marijuana, even because uh, it turns out to be, quote, beneficial and it's non-hallucinogenic. So uh, uh, yeah, the, the marijuana lobby didn't just rely on taxation. They also relied on medical utility as yeah. well, and then uh, individual rights to uh, enjoy themselves. Incidentally, now you find CBD all over the place, and you can get get mm. uh, dog bones with CBD in it. Really, <laughs> uh, Jamie, we're nearly at six o'clock. Have you got a, a final word for us on anything? Um, don't feel no, obliged to. Sorry, <laughs> I don't think I think we've covered it all. I mean, yeah. I, one one thing that we haven't discussed, which is a shame, I'll just throw it out there, is the willingness of um, uh, governmental agencies basically to bullshit people about the degree of risk involved in things that they've for other reasons decided they don't like. I mean, you know, I, the, the, for example, in New Zealand, they tell you that there is no safe quantity of alcohol that a pregnant woman can drink. Well, that's just not true. Uh, and uh, th th there's a lot of that going on. I think the WHO came out and said that smoking, you shouldn't smoke because it, it's bad regarding COVID-19. You can. I think, from what I've seen, there's very, very strong evidence that smokers are less at risk uh, of catching it than non-smokers. So it's a strange willingness to lie to you. And I, it comes back to what Wesley is saying, I think, which is it undermines 
uh, our confidence in the authorities. Mm. And, and, you know, you want them to do a few things properly, not a lot of things improperly. For more information on the history of pandemics, the economic and regulatory impact of the coronavirus, and much, much more, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, IEA London. Follow our podcast at ieapodcast.podbean.com or visit our website, iea.org.uk, where you can sign up to our daily e-newsletter, IEA Daily. Finally, to help us keep our contact going, a contribution, no matter how modest, would be a huge help. You can donate online at iea.org slash donate hyphen now. Thank you very much.